this is our panel with uh, Daniel Burke, Rich Baker, and James Cockrum. And uh, yes, Daniel, do start okay. us off. Um, thanks, James. Uh, can I, uh, do you have a rough time limit for me to keep an eye on the clock there, so I don't run a bit over? Um, I mean, tr if you can keep on, if you can keep to kind of ten minutes or under, that would be ideal. Oh yeah, yeah, but... that'll be no problem. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I, I kind of quickly introduced myself before, but just a, a bit of a rehash. So my name's Daniel um, over here in Perth. Um, the kind of the important stuff. So um, uh, I'm also kind of a humanities person. Um, I'm doing a PhD kind of, except I'm also trying to be making a game at the same time, which is probably not a good idea while working and everything else. Um, and I started out as a fantasy nerd, like probably many people did. My dad read um, Lord of the Rings to me and The Hobbit um, when I was too young to read. And then by the time I was seven, I probably started reading it once a year for 10 years. <laughs> Um, and then we had the explosion of a fantasy material as, as Dungeons and Dragons started to shift over more, like uh, Heroes Quest, that kind of thing. So the, the whole fantasy genre was always a big thing for me. And then computer games came along, and um, I went from wanting to be a novelist to wanting to be a, um, someone who makes games. And that was a long time ago already. That was um, late 90s. So. Um, I ended up going into uh, humanities at university and I kind of forgot about games for a while, um, focused on my study, uh, philosophy, um, Asian studies. Um, so I'm a specialist in Japanese um, and Japanese intellectual history. Um, I went over there for a few years to um, <clears throat> uh, do a master's in the history of, of Japanese philosophy and I ended up working um, in an office. Uh, this is Polygon Pictures in Tokyo, which is an animation studio. And um, it was a bit inspiring. And I remember that I used to want to make games because uh, I saw everyone around me was making things. I had the person next to me making 3D character for um, you know, an action game, Rashid, I think. Um, and you know, there was some very interesting kind of um, TV shows being made, that kind of thing. So I was also very bored at the same time because you know, every day you're in the office. So um, I'd go home and I started trying to program a game. Um, but I, I needed to think about what I wanted to do. It needed to be compact in scope, it needed to be technically straightforward, something that I could do. Uh, and I wanted to, it needed to be interesting for me. So I was thinking about what could suit all of those different requirements. And I decided that I was going to make a game where you run a fantasy in. Um, this is because, you know, rather than having to make lots of levels and places, you could just have one place and have the world come to you in a way. And I remembered this because of, um, you know, a few other people who had been starting at that time, such as um, Tom Francis, who made, gun, uh, who made a gunpoint talking about how hard the content creation was. So I wanted to just focus on one place. But the, the problem, of course, was that I didn't know anything about digital art. So I used MS Paint uh, squiggles. And I hadn't coded in 20 years, so I was starting up Game Maker. And very roughly in the one or two hours I'd have after getting home from work, I'd start kind of sketching some ideas out. So already from the beginning, I had this idea of like a, you know, a fantasy in setting. Um, and I wanted to have the player feel that they're in this location and that the game kind of draws you into this place. So rather than a, a kind of a third person or an exterior perspective or an isometric perspective, you're actually kind of manipulating things in the world and you're running the place in a kind of embodied or corporeal way. Um, I wanted the player to be able to chop wood, to stoke the fire, pour and serve drinks, cook food, and then through those interactions, you know, actually clicking on things in the game world rather than through UI. Um, I mean, I think Papers, Please probably came out. This is 2015 when I was studying on this. Uh, it's already a while ago. Okay, can you hear me? My mic just, um, I don't know why it popped off. We can hear you time. again now, yep. I was worried okay. we were going to have to the carry a picture yeah. the purpose <laughs> yeah. time. Yeah. Um, so Papers, Please came out back then. Um, and so the idea of a job sim is kind of, you know, um, it's out there. And I've been playing other things, um, this, world of, uh, this war of mine and a few things that were kind of bouncing around in my head. And... Um, so I wanted it to be in a third perspective, a third person perspective in a way, but with a vanishing point. So rather than isometric. So it's like a doll's house where you're kind of drawn into the game world. And you can see already this is 
this is a very old image, but this is uh, you kind of your archetypal fantasy influence is kind of obvious there. Um, I was making an early attempt at kind of like wattle and daub style to the walls or, or something, a stone fireplace, this kind of thing. Some attempt at, uh, you know, some stone floors or something like that. Um, and then I was kind of mocking up something. So this is like an early prototype where, you, you know, you're thinking of the smoke in. Um, it's late at night. People are smoking their pipes, drinking their ale in their wooden tankards, of course, and, and a lot of that kind of imagery kind of film. Um, and this was you know, like a basic thing, you could go around and pour drinks and serve things and, and stuff like that. Um, but um, yeah, jump forward a few years, and this is kind of what it looks like today. It's um, it's still, has, you know, it's, it's a, still very much a work in progress, and it's, uh, it's hard to find time um, in between everything else that's going on. So it, it sometimes feels like I'm only putting in a few hours a month. Um, but you can see here that there's a lot of these kinds of you know, objects um, that could tie into this idea of the medieval, maybe such as barrels, such as large stone fireplaces, um, the, the kind of way that I, I thought or imagined the walls. Um, and there's a few other things you can kind of see there, perhaps with the clothing or, or the way people are dressed. You can see down with the, um, the wattle and daub kind of visible there with the cutaway of, of the walls. So, um, exterior as well. So I uh, your Sorry, mic has again. flipped sure out again. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just click the button whenever that happens. So, um, so um, you can kind of get that impression there with the with the exterior there as well, where my influences will come from a bit. Um, a kitchen that's still a bit empty, but you'll be in there and doing things, cutting things, chopping things. Um, I, I really loved making bread in Ultima 7, and I, I want to be able to make bread in this game. That's just one thing that I want to have in there. Um, and then um, walking through, going back to the dollhouse idea, if you walk into rooms, these exterior walls will fade away and, and reveal the, the interior. So influences, this is one of the kinds of imagery, uh, an example of imagery that um, I was looking at early on where I wanted to recreate this feeling of that warm kind of place where people, you know, adventurers and people meet, but also a little bit Le Miserable, uh, Le Miserable I'm saying, okay. Um, and the Fernandier, the master of the house, the thief, which is, you know, not strictly medieval, but this kind of later period European combined together. And, and the idea is a person who, um, you know, tells jokes, tells stories, but is also looking for, um, you know, maybe a, an extra coin, pouch here or there to steal. So you're sneaking into bedrooms tonight and stealing. You're telling jokes and things to people to kind of make them drink enough that later on you can um, maybe take advantage of them having too much to drink. So there's a little bit of a bit of cheekiness in it. Um, pillars of the earth. So I, I love this. This is the kind of thing that for me is, is uh, what I'm so interested in with, with this period. Um, or depictions of this period is stuff like the hearth, the cooking, um, the physical objects that make up the space that people are in, and this kind of um, feeling of sturdiness, things that are well used um, and are made out of basic material like stone or wood or iron. Um, and I did a fair bit of research when I was looking at what I was going to make. Um, if you can have a look at these kinds of images, such as um, the way that fireplaces are shaped or cauldrons or things. And so I, I did spend quite a bit of time um, looking at this kind of imagery, and that's a big thing I'll be doing in the future. This is from uh, Vinland. Okay, there we go. All right, um, I'll try and wrap up within a minute, I think. Um, so that's Vinland Saga. And, and similarly, I, I like this as a resource because of the very painstakingly detailed pictures um, of, of the day-to-day -day kinds of things that people use, the objects um, in the background, all of that extra detail is really kind of um, interesting to me. Um, and then references such as, you know, even something like making these barrels, this was probably took 50 hours because of the way that the barrels um, actually fade away and you can do a cutaway and see the liquid inside and everything. But, um, and the, the exterior of this in as well, the, the way that the shapes work. 
Um, thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what um, people might have to uh, say about the built environment later on in the breakouts, because that's that's really kind of what I'm looking into. But also maybe um, dialogue, discussion, jokes, stories, the kind of social sociability aspect of the two. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I guess we move on to Rich as our second. Okay, let yeah. me uh, wait, end that. Okay, um, stop sharing. Okay, yeah, thanks, James. So, um, hi everyone, my name's Rich, working on Tawny. Um, so, I did prepare a small presentation, Let's see how I get on. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? Is that visible? I just said yes repeatedly and did not realize that my microphone was off. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, yeah, so Tony is a uh, simulation game uh, where you create and run medieval tournaments. And you do that by initially building various structures. So here you can see um, where you would have an event like jousting and melee. Um, Later on, once I've actually built it, there'd be archery as well. Um, or outlet buildings as well, such as, um, you know, blacksmiths or ale wagons, hog roasts and that sort of thing. And you hire staff members such as jesters and troubadours. Um, so as a player, you're asked to select a house initially, um, and then that's your sort of noble house for the game. Um, and doing that means that you have a selection of knights that you can sort of specifically enter into the tournaments. Um, because aside from your knights, uh, other guest knights will come along. And then obviously, um, obviously everyone's gonna be having, uh, fighting against each other. And whilst all that's going on, obviously you have peasants and nobility that come along um, and to watch everything and buy things from your outlets. Um, and in that way, it's a tycoon sort of style game. Um, and similarly, in that style, it's a top down um, isometric perspective. And the, the game really concerns two main elements. And the first is that sort of tycoon style, which is getting visitors in and keeping them happy. So that's where the outlets come in. You make sure that the visitors have things to buy, um, you know, and you're putting down decorations, toilets, and that sort of thing. Um, and you hire staff members that uh, can entertain people or sort of clean up mess so sort of down there you can see in that bottom screen is a little guy picking up some mess um or putting down stands so that the uh, visitors have somewhere to spectate the events you're putting on and the second sort of main element to this is the tournament itself um so it's kind of two games so you've got the areas where you're having the joust and the melee um, and then you kick off various events at them. Um, and then you can track how knights, especially your knights, uh, are doing in them. Um, since you're in charge, um, you have the knights from your own house competing there. And there are various things you can do to sort of steer the fortunes of the knights you're responsible for. Um, one of them is you can annoy your opponents. So one of the things staff do is... Uh, you see a jester there sort of taunting somebody. Um, in fact, stuff, the only people you directly control in this. So uh, you could also fiddle with the running order of events to give your knight sort of an easier run to the final. Um, each event also has a little mini game. So you can, if you want to um, use that to set tactics. Uh, so it's not quite so much up to chance. Like this is all optional. You could leave your knights up to it, you know, their own devices. Um, and they might win or not, depending on how sort of naturally good they are. Um, or you can upgrade their equipment. That's the screen on the right there. Um, some of the concepts involved 
in creating this, um, I had, so there are 13 houses that featured in the game as I showed you earlier. Um, so one of them is Arthurian. So there's House Pendragon there and you've got um, Uther and Arthur who were definitely part of that canon. Now some of these aren't anything to do with Pendragon, um, but I needed a, a full roster. Because, um, for example, there's something that's based loosely on Blackadder, or there's only sort of two or three different characters in that that people would remember. Um, also, there are some families that come from a sort of real historical basis. So there's Horteville, who were a prominent family from Normandy, um, involved in the Norman conquest of southern Italy. And House Roncevo, which draws its name from the battle at Roncevo Pass in 778. Uh, some of the other things are used um, sort of as a basis in this game uh, were, are where the levels are set. So one of them is Atlantis, um, about which obviously the origins are, on, are subjects of ongoing debate. Also um, Avalon from Arthurian legend. This is level one, this sort of my imagining of what our, an Avalon woodland setting might be. Um, and based on a suggestion from James, one of the levels will be in Gulen Sharo, which I understand is from Georgian legend. Um, although I had to sort of Google it and do some of my own research to have heard of it. <laughs> but um, the idea there was to make the player know that the game is situated in some version of Earth. Um, so that it wasn't unusual that some houses are based in real countries. So Orteville being from France. Um, but at the same time, the level locations are nowhere that you can point to on a map. Um, and that allows for some suspension of disbelief and more flexibility in terms of being 100% historically accurate. And that in turn allows for the inclusion of real people and just fictional people. Um, some things I took inspiration from for this, um, obviously the game style itself um, is something that's a lot like Roller Coaster Tycoon. So that sort of influenced some of the design choices. Um, from fiction, so things like films, Monty Python um, was a big influence f for the writing as well. So there's sort of some Python-esque humour in there. Uh, A Knight's Tale or Excalibur, films like that. Um, and I'm also working my way through Don Quixote, uh, which I might finish at some point this century. Um, but I also used a lot of influence from history itself you know things I could find on the medieval era because it's a simulation game set in that time so I wanted things to be somewhat faithful to how things would have been um, so for example the sorts of things available to, available to buy um, here you can see um, two outlets that sell wine and ale um, which obviously people it's well known that they would have been able to, to have access to those sorts of things and similarly food, there's hog roasts um, and, and a pie cellar. And in fact, that um, pastry wagon there uh, is something, a mobile pastry oven like that would have been something, maybe not necessarily at tournaments, but was something that people um, bought from. Um, some of the main challenges I face, I mean, I think Nick's talk kind of touched on this quite well, it's, it's on the ha one hand making a realistic, historically accurate simulation um, or making a game where there's aesthetic or gameplay considerations to make it sort of fun. For example, uh, this outlet here, this giant shop wagon, uh, I think, you know, it looks kind of cool. And I think a real tournament or at any point in history, nothing like this probably ever existed. But I think there's a certain expectation that you would get sort of fun things like this in this sort of game. Um, and from a visual standpoint um, as well, because it's a top down perspective, this is quite zoomed in here. But if you've got a first person game, uh, as we've talked about Kingdom Come Deliverance, so you can get right up close to people and you can see there exactly what helm he's gone, what type of armor it is. Um, but on the other hand, the closest you can get for my game is kind of about this close. So these are not in any way historically accurate armors. And I think they've got some of those uh, colors you can see there to do with the heraldry. 
and obviously you know people are unlikely to have painted onto their armor what their heraldry is but um it's just uh some of the kinds of choices are, i'm talking about where i needed to balance what i thought might be fun and useful with sort of realistic i suppose uh so yeah that's a bit about the game and um gives you a good idea about what it entails um and fundamentally how important i guess medieval uh, era was in terms of uh, production of the game great fantastic um and we are keeping the time very nicely and uh, so yeah um i can now very happily invite james to give our third paddle run and then we'll get into some questions okay can you hear me yes loud yep. and clear okay just shift a few things around Okay, is that coming through? Yep, visible and looking okay. good. So um, this is actually a, um, a sort of trimmed down and repurposed presentation that uh, I gave to a local university's uh, game development course a while back. So I've, I've sort of repurposed it to a slightly more historical, sort of less technical audience. Uh, the plan is to talk a bit about the game and then give uh, hopefully a bit of insight into the technical details and complexity of the project. Uh, I think I spoke a bit to, uh, to James Bailey about this. Uh, one, one of the things that interests me from my career in, um, in uh, software development at, you know, industry is the sort of disconnect between hobbyist developers versus industrial scale developers is not always clear to a hobbyist what the complexity is in a larger scale project. So I'm, I'm going to give a bit of an idea of the, the scale and complexity of a, a, I guess, what you call a real or released project. So um, we're a two person indie startup based in North Wales. We re released our first game, Wizard Warfare. Uh, it's available on Android tablets, Android mobiles and uh, PC via Steam. It actually started out as an Android learning project and was uh, interesting enough to pursue a PC port as well. Um, it's a fantasy themed 4X style turn-based strategy game. It's got a strategic empire management layer and a tactical battle simulation layer. Uh, the, uh, the idea is graphically simple but mechanically complex and that provides challenges of its own from a UI design perspective. So even though the graphics are simple, they have to be clean and crisp and able to present complex information in a sort of intuitive and accessible way. There's a few other screenshots here. Um, one of the units in the game, a hellhound, various attributes. It's got flaming breath and a bite attack. It's a demonic, which makes it you know, vulnerable to holy attacks, but resistant to fire. It's more powerful in hot environments, etc. Another one, a mind eater vaguely based on the sort of Cthulhu mind control, psionic blast, very resistant to psionic attacks, that kind of thing. And again, it's a screenshot of the general uh, strategic layer of the game. So who we are, I'm James. I use the handle Cyanogym generally online, co-founder of Cyanotech. Uh, my academic background, computer science first degree, mathematics masters. Um, we're actually tech industry veterans, not really game industry veterans, and we're part-time, not full-time. Uh, our, our sort of expertise in strategy games comes primarily as being a long-term strategy gamer. I've been playing strategy games for you know, 30 or more years, going back to the days of Civilization One, X, or, you know, Ultima One, the original XCOM series, that kind of thing. So... Uh, First of all, why am I even here? Our game's a fantasy game, not a historical game. Uh, the relevance of the fantasy genre to historical genres, I mean, I, I guess a lot of you guys reading through your uh, your uh, interests and profiles on the uh, document, a lot of you guys can't have shared interests in areas like Dungeons and Dragons and that sort of thing. Uh, so you're, you're, you're aware that there is actually quite a shared 
sort of uh, overlapping interest between the two. Uh, in our case, you can trace the direct roots of our game almost directly back to um, what's considered to be the sort of grandfather of 4X fantasy games, which was a game called Master of Magic by a company called Microprose. And the interesting thing is that company, Microprose, also made the original Civilization. So there was a huge amount of overlap between their, their historical engine for Civilization, which they effectively repurposed for a fantasy genre. Um, again, if you're simulating something like cavalry, historical cavalry versus Lord of the Rings cavalry are extremely similar from a me mechanical perspective. They behave very similarly in a battle simulation. Um, there's also, a, you know, a, I'm, I'm very interested in areas like historical fantasy. I actually mentioned this in the, in the breakout session. Legends such as Ar you know, Arthur and Merlin and uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which is a, a you know, famous uh, Chinese novel where um, mythology intrudes heavily on history, shall we say. And the Total War Three Kingdoms game, it, it, the, that distinction is so strong that they actually have two different game modes. You can play the game in historical mode or you can play it in mythological mode. And, you know, in mythological mode, the generals are super powered and can fight whole armies and the advisors are, can, can cast magic spells and predict weather. So there is, there is a large amount of overlap there. Um, the other area that interests me, um, again, a lot, of, a lot of you are into D&D, some of them specifically Forgotten Realms. I quite like that from the perspective of high fantasy versus low fantasy. Forgotten Realms, high fantasy, where you can't go into a small town without finding some kind of godlike hero. You know, there's ma magic everywhere. That's That contrast with something like Game of Thrones, which has magical and fantasy elements, but they're actually extremely rare. And most of the battles are just between normal armies with the occasional, you know, maybe there's one dragon or, you know, something like that. So the point of all this um, rambling is basically there is a lot of similarity from a technical and design perspective between historical and fantasy genres. And, and one, a game engine divine, designed for one can very easily be repurposed for the other. So yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm just going to try and give uh, hobbyists and non-developers an idea of the complexity of a project like this. I'll sprint quickly through the areas and then I can give people more detail if required. Uh, I'll talk to, you about, talk to you about the languages and tools we use, the code base size. And the, the, the trick here is, although we're not game industry veterans, so a AAA developer and industry veteran will probably have, say, 20 games in his portfolio, but he only have been, he or she would only have been, been involved in a very small percentage of each game, each game. And they may also be limited in the amount of information they can give based on non-disclosure agreements and that sort of thing. Whereas for me, I could literally go drill down into the level of detail. Of not, I could tell you exact lines of code if you want. And I'm not going to be fired for giving away company information and that sort of thing. And yeah, our, our general approach for things like assets and marketing, which is extremely cheap and try and keep things um, organic, so grow organically. So the programming languages we use, um, Android development is all Java. Uh, Unity development is C Sharp. And most of our C Sharp code is actually auto-generated from the Java code using a tool called Antler, which is a computer science acronym for another tool for language recognition. We use Python and Ruby as... Um, tool for, for um, you know, scripting our, you know, our, our own internal sort of tool-based scripting, if you like. And there's a language called Lua, which we use for in-game scripting. That's a very, very lightweight scripting language, which is very handy for embedded, for embedding in projects. Um, HLSL stands for High Level Shader Language. That's basically graphics programming and, and compute programming, compute shader. So any kind of programming on the graphics card basically uses HLSL. And C++, finally, we don't actually write any, but it's generated for us by the Unity Engine's build process. The various tools that we use, and again, the, the trick here is we're our own IT department as well. So we're, if you were working for a big games company, they would have their own IT department, or in fact, any kind of big company would have their own IT department to provide these tools to their developers. We effectively have to do it all ourselves. So Android Studio, IntelliJ IDEA for Java development, Android, Visual Studio for C Sharp, uh, Visual VM is a profiling tool, the Unity Engine itself, 
we run a um, Linux server for a lot of our um, server-based tools. Antler, as I said, another tool for language recognition, Subversion for version control, Blender for 3D graphics, GIMP and Paint.net for 2D graphics, Audacity for audio, Media Wiki for a lot of our note-taking. It's actually the wiki package that underpins Wikipedia. Uh, Trello is like an online note-taking system and open office for you know, documents, spreadsheets, that sort of thing. Okay, the scale and complexity of the project. I, I use um, lines of code as a sort of crude metric. I mean, it's got a lot of flaws, but it's useful just for giving an idea of scale. So for the sort of cross-project utilities, I call it, things which are not specific to any project, but which, are, which we've written, which, you know, thing, things, um, our, our utilities are mainly things like um, graphical tools and things like uh, data structures and algorithms for high performance, bit packing, basically where we, where we need things to perform better than the, the default tools that are provided by things like Java and C Sharp. It's about 30,000 lines of code there, about 100,000 lines of code of game logic, about 140,000 lines of code of tests. The interesting thing there is we have more lines of code of tests that we did than we do game logic, and I'll, I'll get into that a bit more later. Then about 90,000 lines of code of the actual client, that's the UI. So the C-sharp utility server and um, tests are all auto-generated from the Java, but the, the uh, PC-based UI is its own thing. It has to be developed separately from the Android UI. And then it all gets uh, converted to C++ and then converted to an executable. Uh, for the art for the project, we have no art skills at all. We have a low budget for it. Um, and we, the idea is we scale it with revenue. So when we earn money, we say allocate 10% of the revenue to buying things from the Unity Asset Store and uh, Humble Bundles. Within our genre, graphics is not as high a gameplay as uh, as high a priority as gameplay, but it's still got to be clear enough to represent the information. And more important than graphical quality is actually often a consistent style. You, you know, if you're going to pick a level of quality, you need to stay consistent across the whole game. What's quite infuriating is where you have high quality in some areas, low quality in others. Uh, sound and music again, DIY where possible. Low budget, you know, we buy we buy sound and music uh, and audio assets as we make revenue. We made heavy use of uh, sites like Freesound and BXFR, and we also use the Unity Asset Store and Humble Bundles when we've got some money to spend. One interesting area we did find was um, AI generated music is a thing, and it's actually not that bad. Um, especially for game music or, you know, if, if you're looking at retro or, or 8-bit sort of music, AI-generated music is actually pretty good. So that was a surprising discovery. Um, the UI and platforms, uh, the UI design for keyboard and mouse versus touch, again, you, you have very, very different uh, approaches. For example, touch screens, Android tablets don't have tooltips or keyboard shortcuts but they do have gestures like pinch or pinch and fling. So you can see that the UI has to be quite distinct between platforms. It's quite difficult to share UI code if you're going to be multi-platform. One of the tricks, I mean, and Android is actually a bit of a nightmare and it applies to iOS as well. The screens can be three inches to 10 inches and the pixel density can vary hugely. So actually you could have anything from 300 to 3000 pixels along one dimension, which is a way bigger disparity than you'll get on a, on a PC. And also the, the, the huge variety of different devices. On some devices, you can have a powerful processor and weak graphics card. On other devices, it'll be the other way around. So the performance can be a nightmare as well. And Android can actually hijack memory in parts of the screen, especially when if, or, you know, we've had issues where a, we've had bugs introduced by API upgrades in Android where they've decided, okay, we're going to take this part of the screen and use it for something else. And so now one of our buttons is covered by some Android feature. PC has its own problems, but they're, more, they're usually more related to the wider range of um, hardware and user-installed software that can cause bugs. So game, game AI, this is again an interesting area. Most gamers actually just want a fun challenge, but you always have a few hardcore gamers, say it's about 10% of your player base who want a tough challenge. And uh, keeping both groups happy is quite, quite tricky, we found. Um, again, there's the illusion of competence versus genuine competence for the AI. 
um, the gamers who want fun are often happy with the illusion of a competent AI, but the hardcore gamers want a genuinely competent AI, which is a lot more work. Uh, we use a heuristic-driven approach, which is a, effectively a, a jargonistic way of saying we calculate a, a, a score for each AI decision and choose randomly from among the highest scores. Um, that said, for increasing AI difficulty, there's a number of approaches, from cheating approaches to bonuses and AIs more likely to gang up on the player at higher levels versus extra computation, which actually can slow the game down, but you know, give the player the choice of a, a slower game where the AI does more computation to make the game tougher. Testing is a favorite subject of mine, you know, also known as how to release new versions of your game without thousands of angry gamers review bombing you for breaking their game. Testing the live project is actually um, yeah, underrated, I'd say. And uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, our, our testing code base is actually larger than the game code base itself. Uh, we use a, a test-driven development. It's called Comprehensive Unit Tests, which also actually serve as quasi-documentation for the code. That means that the unit tests, if you've forgotten how your code works, which is perfectly possible if you've got hundreds of thousands of lines of code that you haven't looked at in one or two areas for, you know, say, several months have passed since you've looked at the AI code, Having comprehensive unit tests is actually also a useful way of, you, you can look through it and remind yourself how the code actually works. AI testing is based on um, what I call set pieces. So you set up a load of contrived scenarios and just make sure that AI behaves in a predictable way in each scenario. And then after that, it becomes a taste of automated self-play. So before we release, we get the AI to play thousands of games against itself. For balanced testing of battles, we run literally millions of simulations to test things like battle values to ensure some units are not overpowered relative to others. And the key thing is from all this automated testing, if there's any kind of change which can't be explained, that's a problem. We need to be able to explain everything that's happening in the tests. In the tests. And again, your UI testing is much more manual. That's much that's more a case of just clicking buttons and praying. But the actual game logic itself is very, very heavily automated. A testing perspective. Um, marketing is not really that interesting for for this um this presentation. Uh, just broadly, we've tended to stick to a niche approach. So we try and stay with stay in our lane, keep our marketing targeted very heavily at strategy gamers. Uh, what I call the dog whistle approach. Effectively, we don't have much curb appeal to random gamers, but a strategy gamer who looks at our marketing and sees hexagons and that sort of thing will generally know what we're about, what um what we're about. Okay, and that's it. Thank you very much. Great, thank you.